Okay. We're almost at the end. Uh, cognitive computational neuroscience. The idea is it's cognitive science plus computational neuroscience. I hope we caught that on camera because I want to listen to it afterwards. <laughs> Okay, cognitive computational neuroscience, the, the idea is it's cognitive science plus computational neuroscience, right? So it's a, a top-down approach, but also a bottom-up approach. And we focused a lot on the top-down approach in this meeting, maybe because in brain science, at least from where I'm sitting, bottom-up visions have been very dominant. And I think, you know, they're very important, they're very, very exciting. Uh, especially what's going on at the circuit level and with new technologies, the way we can measure the brain and manipulate the brain as we never could before. But they need to be complemented by a strong theory for us to be able to interpret those data. So we could think of this as uh, cognitive science finding new roots in neuroscience, or we could think of it as computational neuroscience growing up toward cognition. Either case, you know, we would hope that it grows together into a single tree. Of course, that's very optimistic at this point, but I think it's uh, something to work toward, and I'm, uh, I'm excited about uh, trying to make that work. Computation is the glue between them, I think. We have computational models at all levels, and they really connect sort of the pieces, the, the details, to one level of description up and between multiple such, such levels. So we had a lot of uh, debates, starting with uh, Josh and, and Jan in the beginning, um, presenting very different visions of how to model what's going on in our minds. Um, so, uh, you know, Josh might say we need probabilistic program induction, which is maybe one of the more controversial um, claims, claims that he uh, made. Jan talked about neural networks. He said about Josh, he doesn't agree with me. Uh, Josh said, you'd be surprised. And then Jan said, <laughs> I'm happy to throw probabilistic inference under the bus. You're not. That was a very clear statement. But, you know, all this dynamic is, is a positive dynamic, and there's a lot of consensus between these two, and I think in our community as well, on many key points. For example, we need to understand how the brain can handle uncertainty well, right? I think most of us would agree with that, and these two certainly uh, would. We need to understand how it can rapidly draw deep inferences. We need to uh, understand how it can learn from so little experience and how to do all of this on, on 20 watts, as Bruno Olshausen uh, mentioned, and everyone was agreeing with that. And this is really something where both of these approaches totally fail, right? They fail in terms of, uh, for neural networks at the level of learning, it's an incredible amount of computation, and it's also not data efficient. Uh, it's very efficient at the, at the level of inference on an image or something like that. Um, and for, for uh, cognitive models and probabilistic program induction that is just extremely computationally inefficient. So, you know, also from an AI perspective, there's a lot to learn from the brain, certainly. So there's also agreement that the brain uses a hierarchy of representations, that it combines generative and discriminative inference and model-based and model-free control, and that we need cognitive models and, and neural network models. I think, you know, these are really points of broad agreement, I would say, between these two and many of us. So maybe, maybe next year, <laughs> we'll see a high five there, who knows. So, but then there was an important counterweight to this, uh, this debate between these two first uh, keynote speakers um, from Nicole Rust, who said that models need to be comprehensible as well. And I think that's a very important point. We want to have an intuitive understanding as well of the models, and we need these multiple higher levels of description, including for these AI symbolic style models. She also made another extremely important point, which is that biotechnology allows us to monitor and manipulate specific neural populations for causal tests of descriptions uh, of neural computation. So we have these tools at the level of, of neuroscience 
uh, that uh, put us in a better position of testing the, these complex models potentially. And this is something that, I, for, for my taste, was too weak at this first meeting. And maybe that's right because we're, we're starting as a complement to this uh, sort of great thing that's going on, these revolutions that are going on in neuroscience at the moment, right? Mike Shadlin in his five questions also said, the missing discipline is experimental neurobiology. So he would go as far as to say, you know, there should be a fourth uh, lower level neuroscience compon component there, and I think uh, he has a point. Bruno Olshausen talked about um, the idea of bringing the cortical microcircuit into deep learning models and, you know, motifs from this lower level. It all also came up in the uh, last discussion about dendritic computation, and we actually had a talk earlier by Blake Richards, uh, deep learning with segregated dendrites, where some of these ideas really from the dynamics uh, of, of s single neurons are being brought into this engineering framework where we can put them in the context of some interesting computation that uh, contributes to the behavioral fitness of the animal. Mike Shadlin also made a couple of, uh, he, he attacked us not only from the bottom up, but also from the top down, from the philosophical perspective. That was kind of a, a double blow there, um, saying knowledge uh, should be viewed as provisional affordance and arguing in favor of int an intentional, not representational framework. So I think this is a very cryptic way of making a very important point, uh, which is that the idea that the things in the brain represent the outside world might be ultimately limiting us. And this is hard. I struggle with this a lot, and I think most of us are bought into this, both at the uh, physiological level and at the uh, higher level, obviously, the concept of representation, which is a co cognitive concept. So I think this discussion will st uh, stay with us for a while. Um, the, the other point, of course, being that all th the brain is all about successful behavior, ultimately, and knowledge is only a stepping stone toward successful behavior. Truth is sort of the, the limiting point of uh, task general ability. So, Bertha Forstmann uh, as, was one of the only ones who really uh, addressed how to combine all these levels. How, how can we take behavioral data and formal models at the cognitive level and link them down to brain activity measurements? I think this is really absolutely key. Easier to do at the neural network level, where you have these distributed patterns that you can pretty much directly compare to measured brain activity patterns, but this is also going on at the cognitive level, and I think very important. This also was done by Rebecca Sachs, who argued in favor of understanding emotion as intuitive reasoning about others' mental states. And uh, she, too, used brain imaging in very imaginative ways to link this very high level, which she uh, addresses using computational models, uh, to brain activity. Yal Neef also uh, linked cognitive computational models to brain imaging data, arguing for a role of o OFC in inferring latent causes. So finally, uh, Danny Wolpert uh, showed the uh, different versions of this book, Principles in, in Neural Science. I don't know if you know the authors are actually here at Columbia. It's uh, Kendall Schwartz and Jessel, Tom Jessel. And uh, I think Danny is thinking of coming here to do what he promised, uh, uh, you know, theorists would do, which is to, to end this inflation of the, the pages of this book and I would be very grateful to him. So this is the, the goal that he wants to see. And I, I hope that, you know, when he moves to New York, which uh, he might do, it's, it's not sure yet, um, but if he does, that he imposes himself there and pu pushes this down so I can finally read that book. <laughs> um, so I think this brings up something that I th I've, could, could be great, which is taking a generative adversarial cooperative approach to the science where, you know, different fields sort of challenge each other and uh, pose challenges to each other, um, both informally but also perhaps formally 
for example, cognitive scientists could define tasks that are impossible for AI people to address and serve as ben benchmarks or stuff like that, right? You could write a computer game that's a good psychophysics experiment that you can do with animals and humans and uh, neural network models uh, can, you know, try to solve it. And I think, you know, that's, that's something that's going to be a lot of fun. Adversarial cooperation is, is what we need. So finally, so we know now that CCN uh, 2018 is happening. So that's uh, after, after this year's meeting. <laughs> so we're excited about that. The location um, is a mystery, even to us. Uh, but we'll, we'll give you an update soon. There's also another uh, really exciting uh, meeting next year, close to uh, next year's CCN, which is a Gordon Research Conference, a very interactive uh, conference on the neurobiology of cognition. So very similarly linking these levels, I'm, I'm considering to uh, attend that one um, as well. So finally, we need your, your feedback and ideas, right? We don't want you to go home and then, uh, you know, to never, never hear from you, but we want to continue this, this conversation online. Um, we need to know what we can improve. We already got some feedback. We need parallel distributed coffee processing. That's one thing, definitely. Um, we need flashlights for the poster session. Uh, some motor nerds told me there was too much vision at this conference. I don't think that's possible, but, uh, you know, and some other things that I'm not going to um, talk about now. We have a list already, but we want much more feedback. We want to really know what you, also ideally constructive, something that we can do better next time, possibly. Um, also, we'd like to hear from you about totally new ideas. For example, you know, one thing that came up over dinner with Weiji Ma was, what about having small breakout sessions with, with each of the keynote speakers and having an ask me anything, where you have a small interactive group and you can ask this one expert any question you want to ask them. And you, we could have these in parallel or something. We probably want to stay with single uh, track in general. Uh, what about sharing tasks, tools, data, models? We, we should talk about how to um, bring that into the community. Uh, sharing challenges for other disciplines, something like speed dating for collaborations or some, you know, crazy ideas, just send them to us. We'd like to, to start this conversation and then pick the best of these. So let's continue the conversation uh, online. Uh, please check the website perhaps in, uh, in a month or so, there'll be also the videos of all the talks here and the debates online. So I'm certainly going to go back and, you know, listen to uh, Joshua Bengio's talk and sort of stop it um, so I can think for five minutes per slide. Um, and that's going to help me a lot. And there's also going to be a board for job advertisements online. So um, Conrad Körding is setting that up, and there'll be a link. It's not there yet, but there, there'll be a link on our uh, uh, homepage about that. So finally, um, I suggest you read a book. Princeton University Press and MIT Press left a few books on the tables outside, so feel, feel free to pick one up for the ride home, and see you next year. <laughs>